Well, it's that time of year. Uh, those of you who have been around a while, and I kind of uh, indicated this last week, and I've been prayerful. How, what, am I gonna or am I not gonna? But uh, I, I'm going to share a personal testimony of my salvation today. Uh, again, those of you who've been coming say, "Oh man, not again! I could stay home today." But, uh, uh, it's good for me to share it. It's good for you to hear it, and I'll try to put it in a way that you're able to understand what and why. Today is especially is significant for me because it was on a Sunday, the 5th of November, 1972, uh, that I came to saving faith in Christ as my Savior. And so with this week, I always get reflective this time of year, uh, but especially with this week, uh, Sunday being the 5th of November, uh, I've been especially reflective. Uh, and so if y'all will bear with me a bit, we'll take our time and, and do this and try to make an application so it will be helpful to all. Uh, let's go with me first to Acts chapter 20. Let's get a good scriptural foundation for what we're doing. Acts chapter 20. Paul is uh, finishing up his last, or uh, I won't say his last, I should say his third missionary journey. That's his last missionary journey as recorded in the book of Acts. I can say it like that. He's finishing that up. He's, uh, he's going to make his way to Jerusalem, and you get to Acts chapter 21 is where he gets arrested. But he's called the Ephesian elders together. And uh, part of what he said, I won't read it all just because I'm looking for a specific thing. But part of what he tells them there is verse uh, 24. we we'll jump right in the middle. Paul says to them, But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself so that I might finish my course with joy. Remember over there in 2 Timothy, right before Paul loses his life, he says, I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course. But here he says, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus, to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Now Paul had received of the Lord Jesus a specific ministry to testify the gospel of the grace of God. I would say to you and to me that we also share that ministry to testify the gospel of the grace of God. To give witness, to give testimony to the saving grace of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to us. So I'm going to seek to do that today. Paul says, I have received of the Lord the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Read verses 1 and 2. 1 Corinthians 2, 1 and 2. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Now we know as Paul goes on, he talks about uh, he came there to give and to give, testify of God and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and then crucified. Of course, we know that he goes on to say that there's a whole lot more things you need to learn. Learning the gospel and hearing the testimony of God and the testimony of the gospel of the grace of God is just a beginning in our life. It's what brings us to salvation. But that's not the end. That's the beginning. There's a whole lot of other things to learn. Paul talks about that if we continue in 1 Corinthians 2 there. 
Now go with me to 1 Timothy chapter 1. Just drop in at verse 15. This is a faithful saying, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Paul says, of whom I am chief. Paul says, I have a ministry that's been given to me to testify the gospel of the grace of God. He said when he came to the Corinth, he tells them that I, I determined not to, you know, I want to give you the to testify of God and I determined not to tell you anything except the Christ and Him crucified. And he comes here to 1 Timothy 1.15 and talks about Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Now listen, if you are a saved sinner and you understand the testimony of the gospel of the grace of God and you've heard the testimony of God how that Christ was crucified for us, then you can rejoice in all of that. Amen? And so I rejoice in all of that. Twofold purpose today, and one is to just share a testimony uh, on this anniversary, uh, 45th anniversary of my having come into trust Christ. And then, to, to lay an example, the greatest tool that you have to reach others for Christ is to be able to effectually and doctrinally correctly be able to share the testimony of your salvation. I mean, that's the greatest thing you can do. <coughs> There's a whole lot in our Bible we need to know and we should know and we should study but any time we're talking to anyone and having a relationship with anyone, we can argue about doctrine, we can argue about lots and lots of things, but if you're arguing with a lost religious person, it's a waste of time. If you win every argument, if you can take them to Scripture and show them all the doctrines that we believe as mid acts Pauline, dispensational, right dividers, and blah, 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 blah. If we do all of that to a lost person, who cares? First and foremost, we have to reach folks with the gospel of the grace of God. And we need to be able to effectively share this is what Jesus did for me. This is how He did it. Amen? Everybody needs to be able to do that. Now I know not everybody likes to talk That's never been my problem. But for some of you, it is. It's just difficult. But all of us, as ambassadors of Christ, right, with the ministry of reconciliation, at the very minimum, we need to be able to tell others, Jesus saved me. And this is how He did that understandable? We all need to be able to do that. We need to do that plainly and simply. Now, my story is not your story, and you may give yours a whole lot shorter and a whole lot simpler than I give mine. And I'm looking at the clock, and I'm going to be real careful, and I'm going to try to pack my life into the next 20 minutes. We'll see. I'll do my very best. I always scare folks when I start because I say in 1956 <laughs> my folks were 15 and 16 years old and they conceived me. They had birthdays in March, turned 16 and 17 and I was born in June 1957. Two years after I was born, my little sister was born. Shortly after that, my daddy had an operation. Two years after that, my little brother was born. They got married because I was on the way and divorced because he came. My mother was 20, it was 1962. My mother was 22 years old, no high school diploma, divorced with three children. A whole different world in 1962. 
she found out she'd make more money if there was beer on the tray instead of hamburgers. That's the business she went into. My grandmother did not do a wonderful job raising the first batch of kids, and uh, she didn't do any better with the second batch. Uh, fast forward. I grew up with a, mi with a mixture of my exposure to church. I grew up with a mixture of Pentecostalism. My dad spent a brief period of time involved with the Church of Christ. And then with the Native American Indian culture and influence, all of that, I was a confused, mixed up young man when it came to the Bible and church and the relationship with the Lord. My concept, my perception, my understanding of the gospel was you believe on Jesus, but then you got to live right. And I just couldn't ever pull off the living right. About 13 years old, I remember making a conscious decision. I am no good at being good, but I'm real good at being bad. You know, when you're going down a and we experience it a lot in this part of the country. You're going down a steep road, and you know they've got those runaway truck ramps. Y'all notice those runaway truck ramps? Well, they're there for a reason. If the brakes fail, you know he can get to some safety. Well, I was going down that steep road, and and I wasn't looking for a ramp. I quit looking for a ramp. I quit pumping the brakes. I was hitting the accelerator. My life got real dangerous. By the time I was 15 years old, uh, I was on chocolate mescaline speed and LSD. Of course, marijuana, all the things that go with that. Uh, I was a thief, breaking and entering. Uh, the state of Oklahoma had exhausted all of its resources. I had been through juvenile detention and drug rehab and psychoanalysis and all of the above. Being expelled after the first nine weeks of 10th grade from the Tulsa, Tulsa Public School Systems, my home at Tulsa, home. Being expelled from the Tulsa Public School Systems after the first nine weeks of 10th grade, the state of Oklahoma put a paper, piece of paper in front of my mother and basically said, you find a place or we've got a place. They were going to put me in the Oklahoma State Boys Penitentiary until my 15th birthday, or excuse me, at 15 years old, they were going to put me in the Oklahoma State Boys Penitentiary until I graduated from high school or turned 18, whichever came first. They basically said, we've got to get the boy off the streets before he gets killed or kills somebody. I was a mess. I was... Uh, I was always a big kid for my age. At 15, I was 5'11", weighed 175 pounds. Uh, I was unsupervised, man-sized, no foundation for life, and had a lot of opportunity to get into a lot of trouble. And I did. My folks tried to put me in the state military academy in Claremore, Oklahoma, and they wouldn't have me. They tried to get me in the Oklahoma State Sheriff's Boys Ranch. They wouldn't have me. My daddy's second wife at the time worked in a big plant, Lowrance Electronics. If you're a fisherman and you know anything about Lowrance Electronics, Lowrance Fish Locators, Step Finders, uh, I guess they're still there. At that time, they were headquartered in Tulsa. And my daddy's second wife worked in both that big factory, big plant, several shifts. And uh, a young lady whom she did not know worked a different shift, different part of the plant, heard about through the shop gossip the situation with me as my folks were trying to find a place for me. <coughs> and so I always say it like this, the right person, the right place at the right time came up to my dad's second wife and said, I've heard about your stepson and I think I might know a place. And they knew of a boy's home and up here on, in Tennessee on the mountain between Dayton and Pikeville. Uh, called the Shepherd's Lane Boys Ranch. The ministry no longer operates as a boys' home or any association of what it once was. But at any rate, 
they found out about that place. They made the phone call. He told them, if you can get him here, we'll take him. And so it was Thursday, the 3rd of November, 1972, that uh, little details, you slip in there. At this, at this point in my life, I almost always slept in my clothes with my boots right by my bed because you know, I would hear a, alarm, a siren at night. I'd jump up and grab my boots and head for the back door. That's how I lived. A knock comes on the door early that Thursday morning. I'm up grabbing my boots headed for the back door. My mother rushes into the living room as I'm coming through the house. It's okay. She opens the door and my dad is there. Well, and that was a shock enough right there. My dad and mother didn't breathe the same air unless they were in a courtroom. Uh, my dad walks in, have you told him yet? Told me what? Well, we're going to, you know, here's what's happening. And I knew my circumstance. I was aware of my circumstance. So anyway, my dad, my stepmother, my mother, and the girl that told them about the home loaded me up in my mother's 1972 Grand Torino. Can you imagine if you know anything about a 1972 Grand Torino and having what would that be? Five bodies tied up in that thing. Two of those bodies hated each other. My mother and my dad. <laughs> and they loaded me up and carried me from Tulsa, Oklahoma to Pikeville, Tennessee. And uh, I mean, we're up in the middle of nowhere. Uh, you have to, at that time, you, you had to ford a creek to get to the back part of the property. And uh, I'm a big old, I always said, I'm a big old long-haired hippie Indian kid. And uh, watching my time here, they gave us a tour of the buildings and had a couple of boys give testimonies. And I told my dad, my folks, I said, I don't want to have anything to do with God, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, or any of this garbage. Just take me back to home and put me in prison. My dad said, no, son, we brought you. We're going to leave you. I can remember telling the guy that had the boys home, his name was Mike Hagee. I looked at him and I said, well, I'll tell you what, if you'll let me stay for 30 days and keep my hair, if I like it, I'll get a haircut and I'll stay. But if I don't like it, I'll hitchhike back to home." He looked at me and said, son, you stay here 30 seconds. We're going to cut every inch of that hair off. <laughs> well, that went over. Well, my folks left, and sure enough, he put me in that van, and we went down the mountain to an old country part-time barber, part-time preacher in Dayton, Tennessee, and he got me a haircut. So picture me, angry, big, angry, hairs in shock, sticking up. Little old Tweety Bird John Lennon glasses, and a scalp. I was angry. Well, again, I'm managing my time here. Things took place, you know, Thursday, Friday. I was real angry. We had a, a, a farmer lady uh, who came in uh, and cooked lunch every day, and I was mean to her on Friday. Uh, security guard from the Bible school I went to or I went to, I eventually did, but the security guard from the Bible school that Mike had gone to came up Friday and he was playing with his siren. And I made a comment to one of the boys. I said, that's just like a pig to play with the sirens and all that stuff. And, and uh, of course, what he, he went and told Mike. Mike told me, son, if I ever hear you call a police officer a pig again, I'm going to handcuff you to that sow and let you spend the night with her. I believed him. And I didn't call police officers pigs ever again. <laughs> well, 
as they were new to me, I, I would argue these different things. I, I knew nothing. I would just argue, you know, what I've been told and what I've heard of churches before. Sunday morning, we traveled to Atlanta, Georgia, and uh, the ministry was supported by other churches as a home mission work. So we had traveled from the boys' home early Sunday morning and in a big passenger van to Atlanta, and we were in a church in Atlanta. Went into the youth Sunday school department, and these little details just kind of part of the story. But went to the youth Sunday school department, and typical thing, and uh, you know, had a passage for the lesson for the day, and each teenager was reading a verse. It came my turn, and I shook my head, I'm not going to read. And boy on either side elbowed me. And you're going to read? I said, okay, but you won't like it. And so I began to read, what, and I was angry, and I was scouting. You, again, I'm, I mean, I, I'm, I'm in a, I, I, oh, I won't even go into all of it. I, I'm in boots, <laughs> hand-me-down clothes. I mean, I'm a sight. Scout, angry, hairs in shock, Tweety Bird glasses, mad. So I read, I said, I'll read, but you won't like it. So I went, thus, and I looked around the room, saith, the, Lord, like that. And that's how I read the verse, whatever it was. Oh, I got in trouble for that too. Well, that was Sunday morning. Sunday night, we went to, uh, it was the Bible Baptist Church in Riverdale, Georgia. The pastor's name was Norman Pyle. And uh, we were in that church. I can't tell you what was preached. But I can tell you, I had been hearing the gospel for three days. And I had heard it from the boys, and I would heard it from Mike, the man that had the ministry, and I was hearing it preached. And again, my perception of what I'd always heard before was you believe on Jesus, but then you had to live right, and I couldn't live right. So I'd given up and really got in a lot of trouble as a result. But I've, I've been hearing the, the gospel. And the gospel is that it did not depend on me. My salvation did not, does not depend on me. My salvation depended completely and totally and wholly on the finished work of Christ. He did it all. Well, I'd never heard that. He did it all. Sam, you don't have to do anything. All you have to do is trust Him. He did it all. Well, that's pretty simplicity of the Gospel. Isn't it? He did it all. You're not saved because of what you do. You're saved because of what He did on your behalf. Y'all hear me say those kind of phrases all the time. That's the Gospel that I heard. Sam, you'll never be saved by anything that you do Straightening up, flying right, trying to become a good boy, trying to become a better person, trying to do the do's and don'ts the don'ts. You'll die and go to hell trying to do all those things. You'll only ever be saved by the grace of God because of what Jesus did, not because of what you do. I often say, plant the seed and walk away. Plant the seed and walk away. And that's what had been happening with me for three days. I was hearing the gospel. That Sunday night, during the invitation, you know, typical Baptist church and an invitation being given, God began to deal with my heart about the truth of the gospel. These are the kind of things that went through my mind. I thought about the shame and the embarrassment that I had been to my parents. Neither one of my parents Christian people. But yet, I had been a shame and an embarrassment to them and the family and in the community. I used to say, and still do, I guess, that I was the black sheep of a black sheep family. And when you can embarrass a black sheep family, <laughs> you're in a lot of trouble. That went through my mind. I have been a shame and an embarrassment to my family. Then I thought about my younger sister, who at the time was 13. And 
I, and, and both my sister and brother worshipped and idolized the ground I walked on. I mean, they, I was big brother and they thought I was wonderful. At 13 years old, I thought how much more trouble my little sister, being a girl, could get into following my footsteps. My little brother was 10. I had had my brother so stoned on marijuana that all he could do was lay on the floor and vibrate to the sound of the music coming out of the stereos. And I thought about that. Then I remember looking down that row of boys. I can't remember his name. I can see his face. I know his nickname. We called him Humpy. Why we called him Humpy, I don't have a clue. But I remember looking down that row of boys, all this going through my mind. I looked down that row of boys, and there's Humpy. Humpy's looking down at me, and Humpy's got steep tears streaming down his face, looking at me. I look up at the pulpit and the platform, and the elevated platform, you know, like a lot of church houses have. And Mike's on his knees beside the pulpit, and he's praying. And God seemed to be. And, you know, I know that God doesn't speak, but I'm just telling you how my heart and mind was working. My conscience told me, that man's praying for you. This boy is shedding tears for you. And you're an awful sinner, and you can't save yourself. I went down to the altar, and Mike come down, and he met me there. And, of course, I'd been arguing all that stuff. And I said, Mike, I need to get saved. And, of course... You know, Mike was a young man and a bit cocky and knew how boys and boys' homes work. And he said, you sure you just don't want to rededicate your life? And I said, I don't have a life to rededicate. And that's true. He said, well, tell God what you need. He didn't lead me in a sinner's prayer. I didn't know how to pray. It was just... Dear God, give me what this preacher's talking about. That doesn't fit all the molds, does it? But here's the truth of it. I knew that I was a sinner and that I could not save myself. And for the first time in my life at 15 years old, I heard, have to have ears to hear and eyes to see and a heart to understand, right? I heard for the first time in my life, the truth of the gospel, and that is that my salvation did not depend on me and what I ever could do. It depended completely and wholly upon Jesus and what He did on my behalf, and that if I would trust Him, He would save me. I come in and I preach to you doctrine and I give to you verses and I can show you scripturally why that's true. All I knew at that time was, I mean, I couldn't give you Romans 4 and 5, I couldn't give you 1 Corinthians 15, but I can give you this. I can't save myself. If I'll trust Him, I can be saved because of what Jesus did for me, and I'm going to trust in Him and Him alone. And the moment I trust in Christ, you're gone. Give me what this book is like. The moment I trusted Christ, He saved my soul. What a wonderful, wonderful thing. Changed my life. I went down there with a scowl and I came out with the burden of sin lifted off my life and a smile on my face. Uh, I talked to you about being mean to the lady, the cook lady that was doing the stuff on Friday. Uh, we go back, of course, to the boys' home Sunday night, and we're there. She comes in. I see the truck come in. I say, Mike, can I go tell Miss Wood that I'm sorry for the way she, I treated her on Friday, and I want to tell her I got saved. Nobody told me to do that. I just wanted to go start making things right where I could. I wrote letters, apologized to my mom, apologized to my dad, apologized to my sister. God had broken my heart over my sin and I knew that He had saved me. Well, that was a long time ago. And there's been a lot of water under the bridge since that time. And 
I'm out of time. We don't have time to go any further with it. But he saved me. <clears throat> Second Timothy chapter 1 and verse 8 says uh, Paul writing his last letter to Timothy, 2 Timothy 1 8. Paul tells Timothy, Be not thou there, be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his priest. So as I live my life today, my desire is not to be ashamed of the testimony of the saving grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in my life. God rescued me. I mean, I could go on and talk to you about my sister's life and my brother's life and my dad's life, my mother's life. I don't have time for all that. But I'm going to tell you, God rescued me. I, he gave me a, a wife, and we've had a life that's honored the Lord. A lot of muddy water under the bridge. <laughs> and if I had time, I'd tell you about the muddy water. But we've been married, come up almost 40, well, 42 years in December. God blessed me with a whole life. God's blessed me with two children and eight grandchildren. God rescued me and changed my life November 5th, 1972. And as I often say, I've not always been faithful to Him. But He has always been faithful to me. And I rejoice in that knowledge of His salvation. Now, as I said, I need to share that because it's good for me to share it. You need to hear someone give a testimony. You need to go back and study and question and examine your heart and life and be able to come back and say, how would I tell my story? If I had an opportunity to talk to someone and tell them about how Jesus saved me, we all need to have that. Was there a time and a place when you came to the end of yourself and you trusted Christ as your Savior? Now, praise the Lord when we've got the Scripture, and by all means, we need that. They've got to step out. They've got places to go. By all means, we need to develop that in our life. We need to have that understanding. We need to be able to take people to Romans 4 and 5. We need to be able to take people to 1 Corinthians 15, etc., etc. But most importantly, we just need to be able to tell people, I found out and realized I was a sinner, couldn't save myself, and I trusted what Jesus did for me in His death for me, His burial, His resurrection, and I trusted Him for my salvation and not trusting me. We all need to find a way to do that. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Now, I'm going to sing this song, and then we'll be through. Y'all go ahead. They've got, places, they've got places to be. Love you. The girls have a rodeo this afternoon. They have to be at it at 2 o'clock. Cowboy Church stands. And uh, they... Uh, Ella's going bull riding. Ella is going to be bull riding this afternoon. And so if you're if you're friends with Eric and Dewey Styles on Facebook, I'm sure that before the night falls, you'll have a video of her doing eight seconds on bull. Pray for a soft four landing. Four seconds, just four. Four, four, seconds. Seconds. four seconds on bull. Pray for a soft landing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Deep dirt. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, I'm going to sing this song. We're going to wrap this up. And I appreciate your patience. And, and if you've been around me long enough, you know that was definitely the Reader's Digest version. Okay? Alright. I've been singing this song a long time. It just kind of goes hand in glove with me giving a testimony because I, I've been singing it so long. And it's, it's the lighthouse. And I can't help but go back to that song when I consider my testimony. There's a lighthouse on the hillside that overlooks life's sea when I'm tossed it sends out a light that I might see and the light that shines in darkness, it will safely lead me on. If it wasn't for the lighthouse, my ship would sail no more. And 
and I thank God for the lighthouse. I owe my life to Him. Jesus is my lighthouse, and from the rocks of sin he has shown the light around me that I might clearly see if it wasn't for the lighthouse where would this ship be? Everybody that lives around us says tear the White House down. All oh, the big ships don't sail this way anymore. And there's no use in standing round. But then my mind goes back to that stormy night, November 5th, 1972, when just in time I saw the light that Christ died for my sins, was buried, and raised in my justification. If it wasn't for the lighthouse, where would this ship be? And I thank God for the lighthouse. Oh, my entire life to Him. Jesus is my lighthouse. And from the rocks of sin, He has shown the light around me, that I might clearly see, if it wasn't for the lighthouse, where would this ship be? If it wasn't for the lighthouse, where would your ship be? I pray that there's been a time and place where each of us have come to that same place I came to 45 years ago. Realize you're a sinner. You can't save yourself. You come to simple faith that He did it all. And salvation is in Him alone. Not in any religion. Not in any <coughs> thing that you can do. But it's in Him alone. If you haven't come to that place, I pray that you would. And for all that will, then my prayer is that you will consider, ponder, and learn how to articulate, put into words, so that you can tell others clearly and plainly how Jesus saved you. And that's really important. You may, there, there may be a whole lot about this Bible you never learned. There's a whole lot about this Bible I don't know. But we all, if we've been saved, we know if, if we've been saved, we know the gospel. And we got to find out a way that we can put the words of that gospel into our story so we can tell others how to be saved. Amen? Mm -hmm. Amen. Let's have a word of prayer. And then we'll sing our song.